And we're live. Good to see you. Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday, uh, December 7th, almost Christmas, almost the end of the year. But uh, we're in uh, part, what is this, part four? Part four of our series, Just a Closer Walk with Jesus. Good to see you. As always, we're going to start in our soul, stern songs, and hymn book. And today we're singing number 36. Christ arose. Now, I want you to notice, if you can see here, the exclamation point on Christ arose. This song is about one of the most exciting topics in human history. Uh, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What a time to be alive. So if you have nothing else to get excited about this holiday season... You can get excited about this. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So if you're alive right now and you put your faith on the Lord Jesus, you will never die, the Bible says. Jesus said that. So that's something to get excited about. So, uh, Let's sing this song with some excitement, all right? <laughs> Hymn number 36, Christ Arose. Here we go. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up. From the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose, a victor of the dark domain, where he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed. Jesus, my Savior, vainly they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor of the dark domain, where he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, Hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen, amen. The tomb is empty today. There is no body of Jesus. Where is it? Show me Jesus' bones. They're not there. You know why? Because he arose. Matthew chapter 27 is our opening reading for today. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27, <clears throat> verses 45 through 50. The Bible says, Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land into the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Ila, Ila, Lama Sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, 
This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. The word of the Lord. Greetings, my brothers and sisters. It's Sean Elvis. It's good to see you again. Part, what did I say? Part four of our series here. I hope you're having a great day in Jesus. In today's video, we're going to continue our series. Um, in part one, we covered, uh, we covered, what do we cover in part one? The eternal life of Jesus, how there is no beginning and no end. In part two, we discussed how Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament. In part three, we talked about Jesus' ascension into heaven and how before he ascended, he called us to be witnesses. Now we're in part four, where we're discussing the resurrection of Jesus. Like I said, eventually um, we're going to get to part 12, which is going to complete our series and we'll be at the birth of Jesus on Christmas. So stick with us till we get there. Um, anyway, in the opening verses here we read in uh, Matthew chapter 27, the Bible says that Jesus yielded up the ghost. That means Jesus was dead, right? So before Jesus could resurrect from the dead, first he had to die. So let's let's look at um, Jesus' death real briefly first. If you have your King James Bible, turn to John chapter 19. The Gospel according to St. John chapter 19. We're going to look and see that Jesus was in fact dead. Okay, and... Uh, while you're turning to John 19, um, I'll read from you Revelations, uh, where, uh, what John, t uh, or excuse me, what Jesus tells John. Um, John wrote the Gospel of John, and he wrote Revelations. But Jesus tells John in Revelations chapter one, verse seventeen. He says, "When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first." And the last, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus tells John that he was dead. But now he is alive forevermore. And he holds the keys to hell and death. We'll get to that a little bit later. But let's look at uh, John chapter 19 right now. Um, starting in verse... Where am I at here? Starting at verse uh, 30, John chapter 19, verse 30, says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Giving up the ghost just means that he died, okay? It means uh, he took his final breath, he said, It is finished, and that was that, okay? His heart stopped beating. Um, verse 31. And the Jews, therefore, or the Jews, therefore, because it was prepar uh, the day, because it was the preparation, the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was an high day. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Verse thirty-two. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So you have a Roman soldier whose sole duty in life is to be a trained killer. That's what they pay him for, to kill people for a living. So this soldier takes a spear and, and stabs Jesus with it right in his side. Now, Jesus, he was already dead. Remember, he already gave up the ghost. He said, it is finished. He took his last breath. He was dead. But just for good measure, because the Jews said, hey, we need to get everybody off. We need to get everybody down, make sure they're dead. The other guys weren't dead yet, okay? So they just broke their legs. But they, they perceived, they said, oh, Jesus, he's already dead. So they just, just to make sure he was dead, they stabbed him, okay? Um, now, we're going to uh, look at this real quick. 
Um, but before but before we do, uh, let's finish the passage here in John uh, nineteen thirty-five. Um, let's finish this uh, section, <clears throat> Thir- uh, verse thirty-five. And he and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, that he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Like I talked about um, in, uh, what was it, part part uh, two. Uh, they're talking about the scriptures here. They're talking about the Old Testament. They're referring to the Old Testament. So we're, we're going to hold our place, hold your place here in John 19. We're coming back. But let's go back to the Old Testament. Look at the scriptures they're referring to in Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12 is a prophet of the Old Testament. Um, if you go back just before you get our, um, it's the second to last book of the Old Testament, Zechariah, just before Malachi chapter 12. And I just want to uh, drive the point home here that, you know, Jesus was dead. Not only was Jesus dead, but I also wanted to remind you that um, it was prophesied. All this that's happening right now was prophesied in the Old Testament. So um, even after Jesus was dead, he was still fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Amazing. Amen. Um, and, you know, let that be a reminder to us, you know, if God has a plan, <laughs> if God has said something that's going to happen in the future, guess what? It's going to happen. OK, if, if, if God says, hey, this is going to happen, this is my will. Uh, there's nothing you could do to change it. Right. OK, it's going to happen. But let's take a look at uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 here. It says, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The prophecy here in the Old Testament, Zechariah, uh, the prophet, is, is, is talking about Jesus. You know, um, Back then, they didn't know who Jesus was going to be yet, but... It was already prophesied in God's word. And another thing, um, not only was Jesus uh, um, being pierced prophesied, but also the fact that um, he wasn't going to have his legs broken. He wasn't going to have any bones in his his body's in his body's broken. And uh, we're going to look at this scripture too. So go back to Exodus chapter twelve. Exodus chapter twelve in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible. And while you're turning there, I'll read uh, for you John 1936 again to remind us. Um, the Bible says, For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him should not be broken. Remember, uh, they were they were breaking all the guys' legs on the cross, but they didn't break Jesus' legs because they perceived he was already dead, thus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Um basically uh what they're talking about here in, in Exodus chapter 12 is Moses is explaining to the Israelites how to perform the Passover meal. And, and they were supposed to take a, a lamb without blemish and they were not supposed to break any of the bones of, of, of that lamb. Because it was uh, eventually going to picture or, or did picture back then um, Jesus Christ in the future who would not have any bones broken. But look at Exodus chapter 12. Verse 46, near the end of the chapter there, it says, In one house shall it be eaten. Talking about the Passover uh, lamb. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad of the house. And, and get this, the last part. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. So Jesus Christ represented in the Old Testament, we see here, not to break any bones, Jesus wasn't going to have any bones broken, and he didn't. He actually got his side pierced, which was also prophesied. So we looked at that. So let's go back to John. Back, Excuse me. Let's go back to John chapter 19, and uh, let's see what happens next. So Jesus Christ dies. He says it's finished, right? They pierce his side, and uh, um, they take him off the cross, and, and um, uh, let's see what happens next. Let's just read it. 
They're going to eventually bury him, bury him in the tomb of Nicodemus. But uh, <clears throat> starting in verse 40, uh, Jesus, or excuse me, John, John chapter 19, verse 40. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never a man laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So Jesus' body was wrapped in oils and linen to preserve the flesh, also fulfilling Old Testament prophecy that his flesh would not see corruption. We're not going to turn there, but you could look at that on your own time. <clears throat> now, um, if you could imagine for a second, uh, the dead body of Jesus... Gruesome, right? It's already been whipped, beaten, spit on, crown of thorns, bloody, pierced the side, the whole the whole nine yards. So Jesus is dead, but uh, I'm sure they cleaned him up as best they could, and they and they um, they preserved his body with oil. They wrapped it in linen, but he's dead. He's a lifeless corpse, right? He's not breathing. He's not talking. He's limp. He's just laying there. He's dead. He's sitting in the tomb, dead. I mean, and, and nobody, even the apostles at this time, they didn't expect Jesus to come back from the dead, right? Like usually when somebody's dead, we don't expect them coming back, right? So we're kind of sad. And so that's kind of the mood of what's happening. Um, even the mother of Jesus didn't expect uh, him to rise from the dead. But nevertheless, the Jews posted up guards, Roman soldiers, to guard the tomb so that they wouldn't steal the body of Jesus and, and claim that, hey, uh, he resurrected, right? But let's uh, let's just read what happens next. Um, and and for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the first uh, ten verses. Um, but basically, what what's happening? And we're going to read. Uh, we're going to go to uh, John chapter twenty. Um, but basically, what's happening is uh, they they bury Jesus. They um, wrapped him in fine linen and oils and all that. And so he's been dead for three days. Um, he's being guarded by Roman soldiers, and basically what happens is on the third day in the morning, Mary comes, Mary Magdalene, excuse me, she comes to the tomb in the morning, and she finds it empty. Not only did she find it empty, but the big, huge tomb, or um, uh, what do you call it, um, the stone that was clo that, that they used to close the tomb, which is huge, which, which uh, nobody could uh, move that by themselves, that's been moved, that's been moved away. She looks inside. She finds the tomb empty. There are no guards there. So she she's wondering, well, Jesus is missing. She starts freaking out, right? And she and she goes to get some of the other apostles. And she says, hey, you guys got to come check this out. I don't know what's going on. What's happening? Where's Jesus? And and so um, Mary leaves. She goes and gets some of the apostles. And, and, and uh, the apostles come back. They check it out. And they're like, whoa, what's going on? So... They end up leaving. They're going to go try to figure it out. Well, Mary is sitting there. She's crying. She's crying, thinking, who stole the body of Jesus? What's going on? What else could possibly make this situation any worse, right? Like, we already lost Jesus. Now now, now somebody stole the body, really. So let's read John chapter 20. And we're going to start in verse 10. Um, Actually, let's start in verse 9. Let's start in verse 9 here. Um, it says, For as they knew not the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Again, going back to the Old Testament, it was already prophesied, but they, they didn't understand it yet. Then the disciples, verse 10, Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. So the disciples left. Verse 11, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, and one at the head, and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. But I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. And knew not that it was Jesus. Verse 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? <laughs> Jesus already knew, but this is funny. She, she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, 
Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples and she had seen the Lord, um, that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Could you imagine Mary Magdalene sitting there crying? She's the first one to talk to the risen Jesus. Christ arose. Amen. So you could just imagine her running back when it, when he tells her, uh, uh, he tells her, hey, um, he says, uh, go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father. So he says, hey, go tell everybody about me that I'm risen. And so I could just imagine her singing, singing hallelujah, Christ arose, right, on her way, on her way to the city. Just everybody's what is this Mary Magdalene talking about? What's she singing about? And she's on her way singing, Hey, Christ is alive. He's alive. Praise God. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I'll read from you Romans chapter 8, verse 13. It says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, let me ask you something. Why did Jesus resurrect from the dead? Like, what was the point of all that? You know, was it was it just something cool that Jesus could do? Or was it just God showing off how, how powerful he is? No, it, part of it is. I mean, yeah, God's, super, God's powerful. He could do anything, right? But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. You see, Jesus had to come on this earth and sacrifice his blood for the remission of sins so that we can have our sins forgiven because it was only the pure, innocent, holy, sinless blood of Jesus that we can be saved by, okay? Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there is no remission of sin. So Jesus didn't just die uh, for no reason, right? There was a reason. He had to shed his blood for us to be saved. So Jesus gave us hope when he died on the cross, when he resurrected from the dead. He gave us a free gift. He said, look, here's my blood, my shed blood on the cross for you. I've laid my life down for you. I've already paid the price of what it takes for you to have your sins forgiven. All you have to do is receive that gift by faith. Okay, You must believe that my sacrifice, my shed blood on the cross here, was sufficient to pay for your sins. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay for it with your own blood, right? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions. So you could either accept Jesus' blood, uh, which was sinless perfection, and he resurrected from the dead, or you're going to have to pay for it with your own blood. You're not sinless. You're not perfection, and I don't think you're going to raise from the dead. Anyway, so for those of us that believe in Jesus, this is good news, right? We have a free gift. We have everlasting life through faith in the blood of Jesus. We nailed our sins on the cross with Jesus, amen? So this is good news for us. But what I want to look at is uh, in Romans 6 here, that, you know, the moment we put our faith in Jesus, our spirit gets resurrected, right? It gets renewed. And uh, remember how Jesus said in Revelations, I read that earlier, that Jesus said, "Um, I am the one who was dead and now I am alive forevermore. Well, when we put our faith in Jesus, our sins are nailed to the cross with Jesus, okay? And, And they're gone. They're not coming back. As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, that our sins God will remember no more. So forevermore, we have life through Jesus, right? That's why it's called everlasting life. Um, But let me say this. Let's say you believe in Jesus, right? You believe your sins are paid for by the blood of Jesus. You should do that, by the way, amen? Um, But according to the Bible, you're saved. You're going to heaven, right? But does that mean that you're never going to sin ever again? No, 
right? No, we're constantly going to sin in this flesh. This is sinful flesh you're looking at. This is a sinful man you're, you're, you see before you. So our flesh is still the same flesh um, that we have before we believed. But let me let me read from you 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So once you put your faith in the blood of Jesus, you become a new creature, right? Does that mean you're going to be sinless? No, but your soul is going to be renewed. It's going to be transformed. You're now going to be an everlasting being. Whereas before... One day you were going to die. You're going to be judged. You're going to go to hell. You're going to die. But through faith in Jesus, now you have everlasting life. Um, just, like I said, does that mean you're not going to sin anymore? No. But there will be consequences for our sin. There's always consequences for our sins. God's not going to take away our salvation. He can't do that because then he would be made to be a liar when he said, Whosoever believeth in me shall never perish. Right, So God's not going to take away our salvation, but he will punish us in this life. There will be consequences, negative consequences for our uh, sins, the bad things that we do in this lifetime. Let's look at Romans chapter 6 here. I just want to make this one final point and then I'll be done. Uh, Romans chapter 6 says, we'll start in verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The Bible is saying, look, if you're saved, you believe in Jesus, you have your sins paid for. Jesus paid for them on the cross. They're gone. You're on your way to heaven. <laughs> Salvation isn't about living a good life. Okay, It's not about being sinless. Salvation is through faith in the blood of Jesus. Remember, without the remission of sins, there is no, uh, um, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, excuse me. Um, but So without Jesus dying on the cross and paying for our sins, there would be no, no everlasting life. Um, but through faith, we can live, we can have everlasting life. And here the Bible says, okay, so then what, right? So now that our sins are paid for, can we just do whatever we want, live however we want? Um, and, and still go to heaven? I mean, uh, technically, yes, but he's saying, God forbid, God forbid you live how you, you live a wicked, sinful lifestyle. Look at verse 3. Um, Romans 6, 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us, um, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Um, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The Bible is saying here, Romans chapter 6, just like Jesus was nailed to the cross, our sin should be nailed to the cross. The way that we live our lives should be nailed to that cross. Like I said, doesn't mean we're not going to sin anymore, but he's saying, hey, just like Jesus resurrected back to life, we should walk after we believe in Jesus as a new creature. We should have a, a new um, life. We should, we should change our old ways and start living more holy. And we should be thankful that Jesus died for us and paid for our sins and that he gave us the free gift of everlasting life. Like I said, you can't work your way to heaven no matter how great of a, of a life you live. You that's not going to get you to heaven cuz it's a free gift, you know? So um we we should be thankful that God's not forcing us, right? To you better change your life around or else I'm not letting you in the heaven. You know, that's not how it is. God gave us everlasting life as a free gift we, and we didn't deserve it, right? He loved us so much that he gave it to us anyway. And, you know, just to show our appreciation and say, thank you, Jesus. I saw what you did on the cross. I saw you resurrect from the dead. I appreciate that. So I'm going to try to live a better life for you because I know that when I sin, it, it hurts you. It hurts those around me. It, it makes uh, your your um, your sacrifice uh, in vain, kind of. 
you know, so it does make a difference to live a, a good holy life. Let's jump down to uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, it says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to, uh, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither shall neither yield ye your members as an instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now I'll close with this, and this is my point of my message today. Is, you know, Jesus Christ, he arose from the dead. And, and just like he gave us his body, you know, we should do our best to try to destroy the lusts of our flesh. You know, our sinful flesh wants to do things that, that we're not supposed to do, okay? But we ought to live our lives um, here on earth in service, in service of others, okay? We need to love our fellow man, love our neighbor as ourself, and not be greedy. Not uh, talking bad about people or making fun of people for our own in enjoyment or pleasure, you know, because it's easy for us to just focus on ourselves and focus on our own life, right? And and not worry um, about what's going on with the next person next to us. But but it, it goes a long way. I'll say this. It goes a long way to uh, take that extra step and, and let, no, let somebody know that, hey, I care about you, right? You're not just another number. You're not just another person on this planet. Um, you're actually somebody who God created. You're a creation of the Lord and, and you're special. And, and treat them treat them fairly, honestly, kindly, and all that stuff that goes with that. But basically, you know, to be nice to people, right? Be generous, be honest, and all that stuff. And you know, we need to live our lives in such a way, you know, where we we're putting others first, right? Because before ourselves, because Jesus, he put he put himself before us, amen. Right? So that's how we should treat other people. We should put others first before ourselves. And um because here's the thing, right? Like our, our life here, the Bible says our life is but a vapor. It's, it's, it appears for a moment and it vanisheth away. You know, so it's going to go real quick and, 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 and we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be in paradise forever. So um, all the fancy things that this world has to offer, all the glitter and the gold, you know, it's, it's nice to have. Um, it's nice, but, uh, you know, they're just luxuries, right? They're just luxuries. What really matters is, is how we treat other people. And uh, making sure we get the sin out of our lives and showing appreciation for Jesus. That's what matters most is how we treat other people. You know, putting um, other people first uh, in, uh, instead of ourselves first. You know, uh, the Bible says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So if Jesus Christ can die for us, um, surely we ought to be able to live for him, right? That's my message for the day, guys. Um, I hope it. I hope it blessed you. Jesus Christ is not dead. He he lives. He he was dead and he lives forevermore. Amen. But uh, that's my message for the day. Jesus Christ didn't just die to uh, to show off. Okay, <laughs> he died for a reason to pay for our sins. So put your faith on him. Get your sins forgiven, and I'll see you in heaven. Um, and and let's let's set an example for the rest of the world. You know, let's crucify the lusts of our flesh, and let's uh, treat the world, um, let's be the salt of the earth, right? Let's treat others, uh, let's put them before us and treat them with love and, and crucify the sin in our life and resurrect the love of our neighbor to our fellow man. That's my message for the day, guys. Um, thank you for listening. Tune in uh, later on this week for part five of my series, and we'll talk about uh, the betrayal of Jesus and his arrest and crucifixion. But anyway, God bless you guys. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful, blessed day in Jesus. And as always, I will uh, give God the last word. We will be in Colossians chapter 3 if you want to read along. But before then, let's bow in prayer. Let's bow in prayer. Amen. Amen. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the day you've given us today. Thank you for this message. What a mi wonderful miracle. Um, you, you resurrected Jesus from the, from the 
from the dead, Father. It's so amazing um, how you planned everything to perfection. Even all those years ago, uh, Zechariah prophesied about it and Moses talked about it. They didn't even know what they were talking about yet, but but you did, Father, and it's just so amazing. Lord, I pray that you uh, bless the people that hear this message. I pray that you inspire them to resurrect uh, in their own lives a desire to crucify the sin in their life and and serve you and love other people and put them first, Lord. As well as me, Father, too, of course. I ask that you uh, use this message and, and this story of this resurrection in, in a great way in our lives and help us um, be a guiding light to uh, our communities and our brothers and sisters in the faith and, and everybody around us, Lord, and help us be more forgiving and and and, and be patient. Be patient with people, Lord. You, you must have been so patient waiting three days uh, to resurrect Jesus from the dead. Lord, I'm, I'm sure... Uh, those people mocking Jesus on the cross, you know, you could, you could have instantly killed them, Lord. You could have taken them out and you didn't even have to die, but you did anyway, Lord. And I uh, thank you for your patience, Lord. Um, Jesus, I remember you prayed for forgiveness for those who, uh, who mocked you. And Lord, help us be more forgiving to people and uh, not be so selfish and greedy. And after the uh, material things this world... Uh, has to distract us with, but a genuine love and for other people, for our fellow man and woman, of course. Lord, uh, uh, thank you so much for giving us another day here, Lord, on your our beautiful green earth, and we're we're thank we're so thankful, Lord, and we thank you for everything that you do. Um, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Uh, as always, we're gonna close and um, close and give God the last word. I'll be reading uh, Colossians chapter 3, and I love this chapter so much, I'm going to read the whole thing. So, God bless you guys. Have a great day. I'll see you. Colossians chapter 3. If ye then been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil conscipiousness, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time, when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all things, put on charity which is the bond of perfection, perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, 
not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Amen. Amen.